Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 23. We're in the respiratory system, and um, everybody knows that the respiratory system's major function is taking in oxygen from the air. So I like to start out the system talking about what's the importance of oxygen. And I have a little video that kind of talks about oxygen's um, scary side, I guess, is what I would call it. So, this is called Oxygen is Killing You. Um, it's a SciShow video with Hank Green, and I love it. Um, oxygen is necessary. Without oxygen, we will die. You need oxygen to produce ATP energy, but oxygen is deadly. So, let's watch this. Outside, the fresh air, that, that oxygen, that healthy, beautiful, wonderful oxygen. Don't you love oxygen? Me too. But it's killing us. <laughs> Today, Earth's atmosphere is only about 20% oxygen. Most of the air that we breathe is nitrogen, with a couple of other trace gases thrown in. But every last member of the kingdom animalian needs that oxygen to survive because it's how we power ourselves. When we breathe in, our blood takes oxygen out of the air through our lungs and carries it to our cells, where it's used in the process of cellular respiration, which is how we turn the food that we eat into the energy that our cells need to do their business. But oxygen wasn't always in the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, oxygen's probably been around for less than half of the Earth's illustrious career, about 2.2 billion years. And it's only been in the past 600 million years that the atmosphere has had enough oxygen to support animal life. So the very first living things on Earth from which all organisms, including us, descended didn't need oxygen. Which means that we have to deal with something that our most ancient ancestors didn't. Oxygen's dangerous side. Maybe you're familiar with rust or that brown color your apple turns after you slice it. That is oxygen, reacting with the chemicals in the exposed metal or apple flesh and breaking them down through a process called oxidation. See, oxygen is a neat little element. It's one of those elements that follows the octet and only wants to have eight electrons in its outermost shell. But each atom of oxygen has only six. Since it needs two more to feel complete, it really likes combining with electron donating atoms like hydrogen when it gets the chance. And that tendency usually serves us well. Oxygen hydrogen bonding is exactly what allows us to turn sugar into energy during respiration. But sometimes scientists think about 2% of the time oxygen comes out of the process not totally satisfied. So instead of being its normal mellow and stable self, it becomes a totally rogue character called a free radical. This thing will bond with practically anything that moves, if you hear what I'm saying. It'll try to pair up with the fats in your cell membranes, with the proteins in your red blood cells, even your DNA, and when it does this, the free radical changes the chemical structure of those molecules, sometimes damaging them. When a protein on a red blood cell is oxidized by a free radical, for example, the protein changes shape and notifies the immune system to take it down in a kind of mercy killing. When cell membranes oxidize, they can become less permeable, and the oxidation of DNA has been known to cause mutations that can lead to some kinds of cancer. Basically, Oxygen rusts you out from the inside. This constant cellular wear and tear from free radicals is called oxidative stress, and some scientists think that it's an important factor in aging. Free radicals aren't all bad, though. Our white blood cells actually use them to kill pathogens, and a growing body of evidence shows that free radicals are involved in the signaling between cells. So, while our bodies make the best of the situation, they also try to keep free radical damage to a minimum. That's why we've devolved ways to combat oxidative stress by using antioxidants, or molecules that inhibit oxidation. A lot of foods contain antioxidants, Oxidants like vitamin E and C and beta carotene, which help protect our body from free radicals by neutralizing them. <coughs> something to bond to so that they won't have to rip your cells apart. Oxygen. You can't live with it. Actually, you can't live with it. You have to live with it. You'll do a pretty good job living with it. I would not suggest trying to live without it. Thanks for watching this SciShow Dose. If you want to continue getting smarter with us, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. And if you have any ideas or... All right. So, um, I hope you enjoyed that video. I think it's a wonderful video, and it talks about the importance of oxygen, but how oxygen can be damaging. So, we need oxygen, and the major reason we need oxygen is so that we can produce energy. Energy that we use is called ATP, and we produce it through a process known as aerobic respiration. That's how we produce the majority of our ATP. Um, but the respiratory system doesn't just provide a means to get oxygen to our cells. It also gets rid of waste products. So carbon dioxide is going to move 
from our cells to our blood and out through the respiratory system into the environment. The larynx, which is a region of the respiratory system, has tiny little vocal folds. These vocal folds or vocal cords vibrate as air moves past them and they provide a, the ability for us to make sound which we then can use to produce speech. Um, in our nasal cavity, we have little tiny olfactory hair cells that hang down and pick up odorant molecules from the air. So when we breathe in, we take those odorant molecules and we can smell things. The respiratory system, along with the urinary system, provides a um, mechanism to maintain our blood pH. Um, the respiratory system does this mainly by getting rid of carbon dioxide, which can produce a very acidic environment. And then the respiratory system provides a respiratory pump for venous return, so when blood is moving back towards the heart, um, our veins are compressed and that pushes blood towards our heart. Same thing happens in lymphatic return. So blood or so lymphatic fluid moves back towards that subclavian vein. We can organize the respiratory system both structurally and functionally. Structural organization starts or has two basic groupings, the upper respiratory tract and a lower respiratory tract. The upper tract starts with the nasal cavity, so we have the nose, nasal cavity, and then at the back of the nasal cavity you move to the pharynx. The pharynx is our throat. There's three parts to the pharynx. There's a nasopharynx, which should be right here. Then there's the oropharynx, which is the throat where food goes in. And then we have the laryngopharynx down here that meets up with the larynx. Um, the larynx is where we have vocal cords. And then our lower respiratory tract has our trachea. The trachea branches off into bronchi, which branch even further into smaller bronchi which we'll talk about, and then has our lungs. Functionally, we have a region called the conducting zone, and then we have a region called the respiratory zone. The conducting zone conducts air from the external environment to the alveoli. So we start, again, at the nas nose, the nasal cavity, the, um, I'm sorry, naso, oro, and then laryngopharynx, the trachea, and then the bronchi. These lead us to the terminal bronchioles down here that bring us to the alveoli. And so the alveoli are these little tiny um, pockets in our lungs that are filled with air. And so when air moves in, oxygen, and they're directly associated with capillaries, so when air moves in, oxygen then diffuses past those alveoli cells into the blood, and carbon dioxide can move from the blood into the alveoli, and so that's the respiratory zone. The respiratory system has a mucous membrane associated with it. Um, mucous membranes are associated with all openings that lead to the external environment. So we have an opening here, the nasal cavity, that leads to the external environment. So we have a mucous membrane. And then um, along with the mucous membrane, we have ciliated cells. We have both simple columnar ciliated cells and we have a stratified columnar that are ciliated. This is what the mucous membrane looks like. Um, here we have a nice layer of mucus. In the cells, we have these little goblet cells. Goblet cells produce the chemical mucin that when it mixes with water produces a nice mucus. The mucus is there to trap any type of potential dangers. And then the cilia, which are at the apical surface of the cell, sweep that mucus towards the throat so that we can either spit or swallow that mucus and it doesn't get into our lungs. So as we move from the nasal cavity all the way to the alveoli, the epithelium changes. It becomes thinner and thinner. So we start with this nice 
and not thick, I won't say that, but um, pseudostratified ciliated columnar. We then move to a simple ciliated columnar, to a simple cuboidal, and then to a simple squamous epithelium. There are a few um, anomalies, so there are regions in the um, pharynx and even in the larynx that have um, different types of epithelium. So that's pretty much through the whole whole respiratory tract, but in the oropharynx specifically and laryngopharynx, we have um, non non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, and the function of that is for protection. So we breathe. And air doesn't typically cause damage, but the oropharynx also is used to swallow food, to help in moving food down. And think about that time when you swallowed a chip and it scratched the back of your throat. If we only had a single layer of epithelium, that would have been very damaging. It could have scratched and caused bleeding in our throat, which could have been really bad. So we have that non keratinized stratified squamous to protect our throat. And so here you can see the thinner and thinner and thinner layers of tissue along the majority of our respiratory tract. So let's talk about each region of the respiratory tract. Um, we'll start with the nasal cavity. So here's our nose. The nose is formed by the nasal bone. We have hyaline cartilage that makes up the um, nasal cartilage. We have um, dense irregular con connective tissue. We have areolar connective tissue and skin that covers our nasal cavity. The nasal cavity then is an internal region that um, allows air to move in. There are two different sides to the nasal cavity, and they end in a region called the coani. So within the nasal cavity, we have bones that cause our nasal cavity not to be just a perfect cylinder that brings air in and to the back. We have these bones that allow the air to move in and start circulating. This actually helps us. So if you look at these bones here, this is a coronal section of a face, and you see these bones that help to um, cause air to circulate through. Uh, that circulation is actually going to allow air to hit the mucous membrane, so any potential pathogens are going to get trapped before the air goes to the back of the, the nas nasal cavity. And the back of the nasal cavity ends in this region called the coani. The coani then leads to the pharynx. Um, in some individuals, a coanal atresia can occur. Coanal atresia is where the nasal cavity, the back of the nasal cavity, the coani, is um, blocked. And so no air can move. This can be caused because of damage to the nasal cavity. It can be caused because you have a lot of mucus buildup in the nasal cavity. Um, you have a um, mutation, the bones form a blockage, or you've had scar tissue, something like that. So unilateral coanal atresia occurs when only one side is blocked, the other side is opened. A bilateral coanal atresia is going to stop all airflow, and that can be really dangerous for infants especially. I'm going to see how long this video is. I do have a little video. Um, I'm going to... Hold on. I'm going to stop our video, uh, and I'll start our next video with this tiny, um, with this YouTube activity or video, okay?